How can we better prepare for our instrument pilot checkride? Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here, m0a.com, and you are listening to the Instrument Pilot Podcast brought to you by our number one rated online ground school that you can now, as of this recording, go take a free trial of that new learning management system you've been hearing so much about, of that new Instrument Pilot course you've also been hearing so much about that so much love has gone into, head over to M0A Trial, M-Z-E-R-O-A Trial.com and take a free two week, absolutely no strings attached, no credit card needed. Hop in there for two weeks, see the science of learning in action through the Aviation Mastery Method, see the new instrument pilot course, the new private pilot course, the new instrument boot camp in there as well. Just so many amazing things. I want you to fall in love with it, fall in love with my teaching style before you spend any money with us. So head over m0atrial.com. Trials are now open and you can check this out. This is, gosh, the new learning management system has been in development for uh, well over a year while we're working on the new courses and it's just so exciting. Uh, the m0a.com team has just come together in such an amazing way, uh, uh, just blessed to work alongside so many uh, smart individuals. Hey, thanks for making this one of the top all-time podcasts in the aviation category. Um, on iTunes, you may be listening to this or you may be watching this on YouTube or Facebook right now, I produce it as a video here as well. So I wanna share with you a little bit today on how to better prepare for your instrument pilot check ride. And you're coming into this perhaps with the wisdom of already having a private pilot check ride behind you. And I also realize some of you listen to all these podcasts. You know, we produce four podcasts in total, private pilot podcasts, instrument pilot podcasts, commercial pilot podcasts, and CFI, Certificated Flight Instructor. Uh, podcast as well. And I see the comments too. You go, I'm just a student pilot. I listen to all of them. And I love that. I think that is so outstanding. You are thinking ahead. So I'm imagining though, the majority of the, this audience, 80% of it, I'll say, are actively or getting ready to pursue an instrument rating. Remember, it's not a certificate. You have a private pilot certificate with an instrument rating. And you're getting ready to pursue that insert rating and you have a private pilot check ride behind you, passed and done. Now that that check ride may be recent, that check ride for some of you may be many years ago as well. Many people will do their private pilot, enjoy being a private pilot and pursue the insert rating when time and money and life just better aligns for them. And I realize in a season of COVID finances and COVID times, um, pursuing an instrument rating may have taken a back seat for so many of you. So hopefully this podcast can serve to better prepare you as this entire month we are in mock check ride May. It's May 2021. For those of you listening to this as a later recording, everything May 2021 is going to be mock check ride related. The ground school member only webinars, the in-flight coffee episodes, everything else will have this uh, this check ride theme to it. And that's very, very exciting to be able to work through. And I want to share because the instrument check ride takes on an interesting life of its own. It is unlike a private pilot check ride because it has its own nuances and yet it's so much like a private pilot check ride. Allow me to explain you realize you are quizzed on and held to what's called the ACS, Airman Certification Standards. And you know we have the Instrument Pilot ACS. However, there is also an unspoken, unwritten rule that, well, you still need to fly good enough as a private pilot to then continue on, right? If you're, if you're landing stink and everything else, if for some reason they deem you are not safe in other operations, even beyond that, like you're, you have to, where I'm going with this is you have to have a strong private pilot knowledge base and private pilot flying base. And I know you will because you certainly wouldn't be put up for an instrument check ride if you weren't. But I need you to make sure 
the fundamentals and the basics are strong. Allow me to explain, and this relates, gosh, this relates to all check rides in a way, but go back if you have done any instrument flying. What were your first instrument lessons like? I imagine you probably didn't get to approaches until four, five, six hours into it. If you're following a 141 syllabus, I know that for a fact. But you probably didn't get into approaches for a while. You probably did what? Level flight. Constant airspeed climbs and descents. Standard rate turns. Compass turns. Like these very basic things. You then also did what? You probably did some private pilot maneuvers under the hood, like slow flight, maybe some stalls under the hood. Like you went and did the basics. And then you go out and all you seemingly do after you get past like lesson five, I don't care if it's a 61 school or a 141 school, you get past like lesson five, hour five, whatever you want to call it, and your life becomes approaches. You live instrument approaches. Your life just becomes instrument approaches and you neglect the basics. And you can maybe relate this to your private pilot days because I would relate this in the private pilot days to things like ground reference maneuvers. Remember, you probably started out, again, in the same spot, how to hold the airplane level, how to do basic climbs, turns, descents, and then probably some ground reference maneuvers. And then you get into all the fun stuff like landings and cross countries and, and all that. And you neglect ground reference maneuvers. And it's funny, it's right before your check ride and you're going, whoa, turns around a point, rectangular course. I haven't done those since like hour four or five. Instrument is the exact same way. There are the basics that you take for granted, like just compass turns, for example, because you've been so engrossed. You've been so engrossed in like the... Um, You've been so engrossed in approaches and holds and working through everything else that it just, it sneaks up on you. The principle of disuse sneaks up on you in a way. So I need you to be prepared and thinking that way and not allowing that trap to set in. I need you to be, be strong and be mindful uh, of that as you prepare for your instrument pilot check ride. An instrument pilot check ride is always a scary one. Um, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how else to put it. It, it. If you don't continue on to commercial or CFI, and a, a big chunk of our audience is just a hobbyist pilot, says, Jason, I wanna earn my private, I wanna earn my instrument, and life is good, I wanna be an aircraft owner maybe, or join a club, or just be the safest pilot I can be. That is, that is a large demographic of the M0A learner. Beyond that, if you're, if you're listening to this for a career, I realize you're gonna continue on. I share all this to say that if you only plan on, if you plan on stopping at your instrument, this will be the hardest check ride you will do. It'll be harder than your private pilot. I, I'm not telling you that to impress you or scare you. I'm telling you that to impress upon you that how you study for this is going to require just a little bit more work because instrument pilot, the FAA uh, requirements, 61 or 141, it doesn't matter in the FAR aim, the hour requirements are just less. The flight experience considered is just less than private pilot in all aspects. I mean, yeah, the cross country is longer and, and these things, but the total hours required for flight training aspect of this, and it depends if you do it 61 or 141 and what the TCO training course outline for that 141 program states, but for the most part, they're gonna always be less than private pilot. Yet it is so overwhelming, the first time you stick your head in those clouds, you realize it is a totally different world. And the majority of your instrument pilot check ride is preparing for and planning and flying what could possibly go wrong. You are going to do a partial panel approach. There is no doubt in my mind. Your vacuum system, right? I'm saying vacuum system in quotations if you're watching this on the video, because I realize it, it could be, you could be flying a G1000 or a glass panel of some sort. It's going to fail. You are going to have these issues. They are gonna put you up in what I would call some worst 
case scenarios and, and, and force you to work through those. If you are not comfortable under pressure, if you are not comfortable with back-to-back -back radio calls, with back-to-back -back failures, with back-to-back -back issues, that is an area you're going to want to work on before your instrument pilot check ride. Because if you think an ILS that turns into a localizer only approach, that turns into a vacuum system failure is, is hard, that's going to be on your check ride. I, I promise you that. It's one, if you ever go on to do your multi-engine, I always tell people, can you do a single engine, this isn't multi-engine, right? Can you do a, a single engine ILS with a vacuum system failure? In simulated IMC, of course. Like, it's challenging stuff, doing compass turns and time turns and everything else that adds to this. It is a very, very challenging check ride. And I'm just talking about the flight portion. What about the, the oral, the ground portion? You've heard me say this so often that a very large chunk of the instrument pilot check ride is what do I know? It's, it's, the flying portion is all about learning new skills and talking on the radios, but the ground portion Man, the, the rules and regulations that change with that. The, I just mastered this thing called a VFR sectional chart, and now there's a, a low and root chart that uses only four colors, and I've got to learn this thing now. Why only four colors? Was the FAA printer low on ink that day? Like, what? Why do I need to learn something? To, I, I just remember these thoughts going through my head as I was working to become an instant rated pilot. And again, I... This sounds weird for me because I am such an optimist about everything. You might be thinking, is this the same Jason? Jason's like optimistic about anything, but he's being so pessimistic about this instrument check ride. And I'm not being pessimistic. Yes, I am a glass half full and overflowing oftentimes kind of person, but I'm just trying to not bury and hide the truth from you that this will be a challenging check ride for you. And I find many people underprepare for it or worse, don't know how to prepare. So I'm gonna read a little bit uh, from Pass Your Instrument Pilot Check Ride. Again, I'm not here to sell you anything. M0A and, and the Shepard family and our 33 team members that work for us are fine, right? We will be fine whether you buy a book or not, whether, uh, I always, it always cracks me up a little bit when uh, people come up to me at like Oshkosh or Sun and Fun and go, Jason, I've never bought any of your products before. I only watch your YouTube videos, so I'm, so, I'm sorry for that, but I just wanna tell you thank you. Thank you. I, I love it. Don't, you don't have to ever buy anything from us. We are a give first uh, type business and a give first community, no doubt. Um, so, but just know that this is a resource that is available as an audio book as well, uh, so you have that. But let, let's just, let me read to you the chapters here to see how, how strong you feel about this. So IFR flight, and maybe just give yourself a one to five, five being, man, I, I, could, I could teach this to Jason kind of stuff, one being, we need some serious work on these topics. Maybe just think about those numbers in your head. Uh, how would you rate yourself in IFR flight planning? IFR charts and information, how our instruments work, aviation weather related to IFR, the FAR aim, airspace related to IFR operations, IFR departures, aeromedical factors, IFR en route, and that's different than IFR flight plan, by the way, lost comp procedures, that gets its own chapter because Gosh, we could just work through that. That could be its own instrument podcast, and it has in the past. IFR arrivals. It, it, it's a lot here. Just to work through some of these questions. When can a pilot use a GPS system for IFR navigation? Do you know? And I'm, I'm, I'm allowing this awkward pause here so you can kind of think about it in your head. When can a pilot use a GPS system for IFR navigation? It says, obviously, the unit must first be approved and certified by the FAA. You can't just go mount your iPad or mount some Garmin 496 handheld GPS and, and call it IFR. It has to be approved and it has to actually be mounted in the aircraft. The pilot also has to make sure that he or she has a current and updated database of waypoints and instrument approach procedures. 
In addition, a pilot needs to make sure the aircraft has an alternative navigation system that is approved by the FAA and is appropriate to the route being traveled. So what do I need? I need an IFR approved GPS unit. I need current databases and I need a backup, right? Something other than GPS. That's why we, we still practice localizer and ILS and VOR approaches. We did get into things like weather as well. Even the basics, what are the four main types of fronts? What are the four main types of fronts? We have a cold front, a warm front, a stationary front. You know the fourth one? An occluded front. And you definitely need to know an occluded front because that's where your tornadoes and such form from. All right, um, let's look at some others here. Here you go. What are the four different types of clouds? Maybe said another way that I've used in the courses, what are the four cloud families? We know we have four families of clouds and they're, they're classified according to their, the height of their basis. So we have low clouds, middle clouds, high clouds, and clouds with extensive vertical development. Low clouds are clouds that form at the surface up to 6,500 feet. Middle clouds are clouds from 6,500 to 20,000. High clouds are 20,000 feet and above. And then there's obviously clouds with extensive vertical development. I didn't say, you know, types of clouds, stratus, cumulus, cumulonimbus, uh, alto stratus, alto cum, I didn't get it serious. I didn't get into all the, those clouds. I just asked where are the four cloud families. And within those families, we can break it down into types. And this is considered the basics, right? This is considered the beginning of all these sort of things. Just to, to breeze you through some more things here. Um, other questions. One is a safety pilot. What are the fuel requirements in IFR conditions? Let's talk airspace here. Can you define class E airspace? That's a broad question, isn't it? Could you define class G airspace? Another broad question. Uh, define national security areas. Did you know there are two types of DPs, departure procedures? Again, you, you see where I'm going here. There is such a wide array of knowledge. And yes, a lot of that is instrument specific, but a lot of the questions, like the weather questions and the aeromedical questions and the decision-making questions have a fundamental foundation in where it all began for you at the private pilot level. Right? I mean, aeromedical factors don't change a lot between private and instrument. You certainly need to know more at an instrument level than you did at a private pilot level, but there's still the same four types of hypoxia. There's still the different types of spatial disorientation. Those are all still the same. So you, you need to know and understand and map that out and know it at, a, at an even higher and deeper level. And I'll end with this. And we try to keep these podcasts short, and this is, this is even long for a, for a typical podcast for me. I want to be quick. Uh, what they, I think the average commute for, in the U.S. is 15 minutes. Not that any of us commute anymore. We all work from home, so maybe you want longer content. But uh, I, I, will, I will end with this thought that the knowledge that you had for a private pilot is going to serve you in the instrument realm. But you need to know it at a higher level. And the advice I would give you is to learn it like you are going to teach it. Let me share with you a secret. I did not become a good pilot. And I'm, aspiring, I'm an aspiring great pilot. I'm an aspiring master pilot. There's a reason we say a good pilot is always learning because I think the moment you call yourself a great pilot, you're going to hurt yourself because you're a little too, uh, you're not humble enough for me, right? You might be a little, I want you confident, but not that confident. So we were, I'm just okay being a good pilot. I know my limitations. I didn't become a good pilot though until I became an instructor. And it wasn't that the, becoming an instructor was like some holy crusade by any means. It was the fact that I had to learn stuff to, at a level that I had to then explain it in plain English to other people. And when I had to have the knowledge in my head concise enough that I could speak it in plain conversational English to others, it's when it clicked for me. 
go back. If you look at my early written test, my early knowledge test scores, you'll know I was not a good student. You may have heard this before. Uh, and again, if memory serves me right, it's been almost two decades now. I want to say it was a 72 on my private palette knowledge test. I know for a fact it was a 70% on my instrument palette knowledge test. I'm embarrassed to admit that. I was a terrible, terrible student. Isn't karma full circle and funny? Look what I do for a living now. And, and we, we help uh, learners all over the world now, like yourself, earn well above the national average. I mean, I have never seen so many 100% and, and 97s on knowledge tests. We just have that, that, I'm telling you, this new learning management system, I am not one to brag or boast, but you need to get in there and check it out because there is science to back up every little thing that we did. Every, there is not one word wasted in a video. There is not one quiz question wasted. Everything is so purposeful and it's so science filled and real world flying filled that students are leaving there not only safe real world pilots, but with exceptional results. I'm on my soapbox now. Life is full circle. Look what we do for a living now. Then you look at my, my written test, my knowledge test results when I, I got 100% on my FOI. I, I, I don't remember when I got my flight instructor airplane or my CFII or anything like that. Um, I, I just know that, and we could look it up, I'm sure, but when I had to learn something well enough to teach it, it became an instant game changer for me. Um, about a year ago, I became a helicopter pilot. I just, I just did my private and my instrument. And I'm gonna jump to ATP probably next, but COVID and a lot of other things kind of put a damper on that for a bit. And then business has just been so, so busy and grown exponentially. Um, the helicopter took a bit of a back seat. But when I did my helicopter check ride, I did my private and my instrument check ride in the same day. You want to talk about a crazy check ride marathon. It was an awesome day. Um, I went into that where I literally made lesson plans for the aerodynamics of helicopters. I made lesson plans for just helicopter specific things that I didn't know and understand. I drew my diagrams, I drew my systems. So I went in there and at a private pilot check ride, I treated it like it was a CFI check ride. He even said something, he goes, wow, you're really prepared for this. I said, drawing pictures helps me to explain this. And, and I just hold myself to a very high standard. And you can draw pictures. And you can bring in your notes to your check ride and, and things that can help jog your memory. And I, I used it as a teaching aid and I used it as a memory aid for me as well. And I encourage you to do the same. The premise of this very long uh, talk is when you have to know something well enough to teach it, your learning will become exponential. Start looking at your instrument lessons and your instrument flying like you were gonna go teach it. How would you explain this to your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your dog? I, I don't care, your neighbor. Talk out loud to yourself in your car. I, I don't know what it's gonna take. How would you explain hypoxia in plain English? Teach me a departure procedure. There's two, two of them, two types of them, by the way. Like, how would you go through that? That's, I'm not, I'm not looking for rote memorization. I'm looking for someone who can explain in plain conversational English the principles of instrument flying. Because that's what makes you a safe real world pilot. I'm rambling now, team, and I apologize for that. Please do go check out uh, a, a two-week, no-strings-attached trial of the online ground school. Uh, so much love has gone into this. I am so proud of what the team has accomplished. M0Atrial.com. Please check that out. Hey, I love your comments on YouTube, on Facebook. Send us a support ticket. Give this five stars on iTunes. Uh, share this with your friends, your family. I hope by listening today, we saved one life. I realize that sounds kind of weird and creepy, and I was sharing this with some of our business coaches and consultants today that, you know, my goal has always been to create safer, smarter pilots, but my, but my prayer before going live, my, before any webinar or in-flight coffee, my prayer before every video, every podcast has been this, you know, put the breath in me, put the words in me that, that will come out and use me as a vehicle and a voice to communicate a message that just saves one life. That's, that's the goal. 
And that's an untrackable goal. I mean, maybe someone will reach out one day and say, hey, Jason, I am positive. I listened to this episode of the Instrument Pod podcast and what you said saved my life. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe we'll never know, right? Maybe you just said, I'm not flying today. And that saved your life and neither of us will ever, ever know. And, and I'm fine with that. I, I, we, are doing, we are doing big, big work uh, here at M0A.com. And I, and I hope the passion comes through, not just from myself, but from every member of the M0A.com team. We are just, um, we are guided by such a purpose uh, to deliver aviation safety to the masses. And our goal is to make it fun, to make it catchy, to, to make you a part of our family. And our goal is not, not to make a ton of money, as crazy as that sounds. Our goal is just to save a life today. It's that simple. And I think by, by having that mission of giving first and helping first, um, we will in turn be helped and blessed because of that. So, um, different way to run a business, I guess. Anyways, Emissary Nation, I can't thank you enough. I can't wait to hear from you, hear your success stories. I can't wait to see in the Emissary Nation Facebook a picture of you with your temporary airman certificate. Do make sure you're in the M0A Nation Facebook group as well. Uh, as of this recording, 6,000 some odd members strong. It's incredible. It's incredible, this movement uh, that you all self-perpetuate. So thank you for that. Have a blessed, amazing, outstanding rest of your day. And most importantly, remember, the good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you.